Welcome to the Maxim Integrated Webinar Series. Today, we'll learn all about the world's thinnest optical module for wearables. I'm Ben Smith, and I work in Maxim's Training and Technical Services Group as a principal member of the technical staff. Our presenter today is Sudhir Mopuru. Sudhir joined Maxim Integrated in 2013 with more than 25 years of experience in the electronics and software industry in roles that range from sales to product management. In his current role, he's responsible for Maxim Sensor Solution Initiatives for fitness and wellness wearables. Sudhir holds a bachelor's degree in electronic engineering from the Osmania University in India and a master's in business management from the University of New Hampshire in the USA. So with that out of the way, Sudhir, take it away. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everyone. Before we get into the details of the world's thinnest optical module, uh, Max M86146, and its unique features, I want to spend a few minutes to talk about the critical role of actionable insights for wearable health because it directly ties into the very reason why we designed the world's thinnest optical module. To kick off, we would like to start off with asking you a simple question. Uh, are you actively designing or designed a wearable in the past? I'll give you a few seconds to answer the question and then we can get started. We just wanted to gauge uh, the audience today, which is why we were asking this question. <clears throat> we believe uh, wearable healthcare, uh, as we know, is moving towards adding a lot of value to the consumers uh, for both wellness as well as the clinical application. So, as, uh, as uh, wearables is, uh, wearable health is moving towards providing actionable insights, uh, as the name suggests, actionable insights is when a user can actually do something with the data they collect. At Maxim, our goal has always been, how do we move towards actionable insights as opposed to gathering information? For instance, instead of simply monitoring heart rate or SpO2, we need to think about what insights can we share with the users based on the information we're gathering. Let me give you another example. Continuous glucose monitors. Uh, they have both analytics as well as apps these days. Uh, they not only monitor the daily trends of glucose, but they also offer diet recommendations, which is an example of an actionable insight. Let's see how the results look like. So we have quite a few people who, have, who had experience in designing wearables and quite a few who are new to this uh, space. So welcome all. For the people who have designed, uh, you know the elephant in the room uh, that we're trying to solve. The global uh, healthcare costs are on the rise. They are around $9 trillion, and, uh, which is roughly 10% of the GDP and it is growing at two to three X inflation rate. We believe wearables can play a significant role in slowing down the healthcare costs. Wearable remote patient monitoring is gaining momentum because it provides access to health insights, which not only helps the doctors, but also the end users to proactively manage both preventive care as well as chronic conditions. Also, more, we are now able to integrate more sensor modalities into wearables. For instance, uh, today's wearables can do heart rate and SpO2, and recently we've seen wearables that can monitor temperature, ECG, bioimpedance, all in a single device. Uh, with uh, multiple sensor modalities, developers can now take advantage of the sensor fusion to improve the accuracy of the actionable insights.
We also see a clear shift in consumer mindset. Uh, we see they're moving away from let's deal with the health issue when you're sick uh, to a more preventive and early detection uh, side of things. And for consumers with chronic diseases, especially for diabetes, uh, the picture that you see here, they can now monitor the trends with more convenient and comfortable wearable devices. So instead of uh, monitoring glucose with blood samples for diabetes patients, you can now monitor glucose continuously for seven to 10 days with a simple wearable patch. Isn't that amazing? At least I find it very uh, amazing. As the customer's mindset is changing, like we talked about, and more and more comfortable form factors uh, start to show up, consumers' expectations are also on the rise. Now they expect their devices to provide clinical grade accuracy and actionable, with uh, actionable insights. And uh, trust me, wearables are trying very hard to meet these expectations. A good example of that is oxygen saturation. It used to be a vital, a vital sign that typically uh, a doctor would measure at a clinic, but now there are several wearables in the market that can monitor oxygen saturation on your wrist-based device or a finger-based device. With the same level of accuracy that you would get at a, a clinician's office. As you can see, this change in customer mindset and also advancement in sensor technologies, uh, it offers a very unique growth opportunity for wearables. As you can see, the chart estimates are roughly under 350 million units by 2023. I personally, I should probably stress the word personally uh, because I don't wanna speak for Maxim here. I personally feel this chart is overly conservative. Think about it. We have 7 billion people in the world. As wearables are getting smarter and able to provide more meaningful, actionable insights, I expect more and more people to adopt wearables for remote monitoring. When you think of uh, remote monitoring, uh, we can broadly classify uh, remote monitoring into three stages. General predictive monitoring, in-home monitoring, or also known as point of use, and in-hospital monitoring, which is point of care. Let's take a simple use case of COVID-19 to understand how wearables and their actionable insights can play a key role in each of these stages. COVID-19, we're all feeling the impact of it, right? It is a very reason why we are not in Munich, but online today. According to WHO guidelines, temperature, oxygen saturation, and respiration are leading indicators of someone who contracted COVID-19. By monitoring temperature and SpO2, you can not only screen potential uh, cases, but also isolate others that may have come in contact with the potential patients. Now that is predictive screening. If I move to the uh, top right corner, in addition to temperature and SpO2, uh, if I can now monitor respiration and heart rate, it can be very critical in identifying high risk cases, which some of them may, uh, may need to go to the hospital for additional care. Similarly, wearables can also monitor patients while they're in the hospital and after they are discharged. So as you can see, wearables uh, can have a, a significant impact in each of these uh, stages. And some of these stages, uh, if, you pay, if you pay close attention to it, does require FDA approval, which goes back to my comment about customer expectations of a of having clinical grade accuracy from their wearable devices.
Here is a quick look at different sensor technologies that can be used for monitoring the early indicators of infectious diseases. For instance, you can monitor temperature trends using skin temperature under axilla or wrist or other body locations. Similarly, on SpO2 or oxygen saturation, using optical-based uh, sensor technology on the finger, wrist, or sternum, you can, you can identify the drops in oxygen saturation. A respiration rate, again, uh, the trend of increasing respiration rate is a good indicator of somebody having uh, uh, infectious diseases like COVID-19. Bioimpedance across thorax uh, was one of the techniques. And the other techniques that are typically used for respiration are uh, inferred uh, respiration rate from ECG and optical technologies. Heart rate, again, uh, in elevated heart rate uh, 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 can also be a very good indicator in combination of other vital signs. Again, this can be measured using ECG across uh, the chest or using optical-based uh, PPG technology. So to address the market needs, Maxim has invested in four different sensor technologies uh, to provide complete solutions for wearables, especially when it comes to health. Biopotential, which includes ECG and bioimpedance, Optical, which includes PPG, uh, also stands for photoplethysmography, temperature, and electrochemical. The common theme across all our sensor portfolio is two things. Number one, lower power. Power, power, power. Wearables, power is everything. We fully understand that, and we have some of the lowest power uh, solutions in the industry. And the second common theme across all these technologies is the ability to meet clinical requirements. All our sensors are designed uh, to help our customers meet uh, clinical requirements, whether it is FDA or whether it is a CFDA or other medical requirements. We have several customers using Maxim sensors and have successfully cleared FDA, uh, which, which stands as a testament to the performance of the sensors. In addition to best-in-class sensors, we've also invested heavily in packaging innovation. The idea was to make these sensors smaller, especially for space-constrained applications, such as in-ear or finger-based applications, and more and more, uh, even for wrist wearables. The world's thinnest optical module that we want to talk to you about today is uh, one such example of packaging innovation. We'll talk about that in just a minute here. In addition to uh, developing the clinical grade sensors, early on we realized for us to be successful in the wearable space, we needed to have, be able to provide a complete solution, which is why we invested in this, uh, developing our own algorithms. We do work with third-party algorithms as well, uh, where it makes sense. Uh, we have several strategic partnerships uh, in the algorithm space. And the idea is to be able to provide an ecosystem for our customers to be able to adopt a solution. Last but not the least, uh, again, when you're talking about especially optical technologies, one of the key uh, factors of designing a good optical-based uh, subsystem is understanding the uh, inter interaction between the optics and the tissue. So Maxim has an optomechanical design team that studies the interaction between the tissue and the optics and comes up with advanced optical architectures to enable different use cases, whether it is heart rate, SpO2, and uh, some additional use cases as well. As a result of all of these pieces, I, I, I call them the pieces of puzzle. So these are all the pieces in a puzzle. You need to have a really good sensor, low power sensor. It has to be small enough, and then you have to have advanced algorithms, but you also need to have a good optical design. Or in case of ECG, you need to have a good electrode design. Or in case of a temperature, you need a good um, uh, conductor between the skin and the sensor. 
So being able to provide the mechanical design guidelines across all our technologies allows us to offer several reference designs with proven use cases. Having said that, I wanted to introduce uh, you to the world's thinnest optical module, MAX M86146. MAX M86146, as I mentioned before, is uh, part of our packaging innovation, uh, where we wanted to reduce the overall uh, size and the volume of the module for wrist-based and chest-based applications. Um, this chip or this module integrates two photodiodes, one PPG analog front end, and an M4F MCU. The PPG analog front end offers highest SNR to enable SPO2 on the wrist and also includes automatic ambient light cancellation, among other things. The MCU inside the module uh, is, uh, comes with fully integrated firmware and algorithms. So there is no additional development work uh, from a customer standpoint to integrate the solution into their uh, design. And it truly is the thinnest optical module on the planet. And let me show you why. If you look at a traditional uh, optical design uh, for people that had an experience in designing a wearable, especially an optical wearable, uh, you probably would recognize uh, <clears throat> what I'm talking about here. Uh, typically, when you design an optical subsystem, uh, think of a PCB with uh, double-sided components. On the top side of the PCB, you have your optical components. The circles that you see on the left-hand side image are your LEDs, and the rectangular or the yeah the square uh, device in the middle is a photodiode. On the bottom side of the PCB, you have a PPG analog front end and a sensor hub MCU that integrates the firmware and the algorithms. This is a traditional way of designing an optical subsystem. And what we were able to do with Maxim eight six one four six was take all these three blocks that are indicated uh, in red lines and integrate them into a single chip and uh, pay close attention to the Z height of this module. It is 0 0.88 mm in Z height. It's 45% less in Z height compared to the overall traditional solution and 30% less in area. This is an embedded substrate technology uh, that Maxim has invested uh, for the last few years and we're pretty proud of the product uh, in the market today. We're seeing a lot of interest over a lot of customers adopting this, a complete solution. So not only did we build this module, which was great, but how do customers take advantage of it? Uh, as I said before, uh, we, when we wanted to get into the wearable space early on, we realized that uh, the only way we can succeed is by showing our customers how to implement a complete solution. So here is an example on the left-hand side, a 3D printed enclosure. This is based on Maxim's optical design, and it integrates uh, the external LEDs with Maxim 86146 and a host uh, board that has Bluetooth communication, and it enables heart rate SpO2 uh, sleep, stress, fitness score, the entire algorithm suite. And we not only developed these algorithms and the solutions, we actually went to an independent lab, especially when you talk about oxygen saturation. Uh, there is no easy way to test it. The only way to do it is at a medically controlled or medically supervised uh, independent lab called hypoxia lab. So we took this reference design to an hypoxia lab, validated the reference design and the algorithm performance to show our customers that we can meet FDA guidelines for oxygen saturation. Uh, one of our customers, Care Predict, took our reference design and integrated that into their wearable device, uh, which is now able to monitor heart rate and SpO2 for remote monitoring of, for the elderly population. 
and you see the product image on the right hand side. Although the image in the previous slide showed uh, wrist wearables, this module is applicable for both chest and uh, abdomen locations as well. We hope we were able to demonstrate how Maxim is enabling personalized healthcare by meeting the demands for remote monitoring, uh, especially for wearables, which in turn, we believe, enables better predictive and preventive healthcare and chronic disease management. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, Sudhir, for the informative presentation. And I have a feeling we're going to get a lot of questions about this. But before I open up the Q&A, uh, I'd just like to point out the Contact Us window on your screen. Now, if you have questions that go beyond what uh, Sudhir has covered today, uh, just fill out that form, and we'll be in touch uh, to resolve any questions that you might have. So let's take a look at the, um, at the questions, uh, Sudhir. Um, first of all, uh, it's, it's nice to have this uh, really cool, thin form factor, but do you have sensors in other form factors? Yes, uh, we do have uh, discrete implementations as well where our customers would like to integrate uh, the analog front ends with their own discrete uh, implementations or their own optical designs. Uh, and we have several customers uh, who, are, who are in that board that have successfully implemented the wearable products. Uh, I can give you examples uh, in a ring form factor, in a wrist form factor, obviously uh, the largest acceptable form factor today, chest space form factors, uh, abdomen, uh, and also uh, forehead applications. Okay, very good. Um, uh, one question that came in, and I'll bet this is one that a, a lot of folks have, um, is this sensor um, water resistant? And they specifically mention IP54 or IP67. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, it is not. Uh, that's a great question. I'm glad uh, the, uh, the, uh, the question came up. Uh, one thing, uh, this is not um, uh, water resistant, so you will need to do the industrial design if you want to make it uh, water resistant. The module itself uh, cannot uh, be interfaced with this tissue of the skin directly. It needs a cover lens uh, or a cover glass uh, between the module and the uh, human skin. There is another, another. Uh, uh, sorry, Ben. Just one last thing. Go ahead. Uh, there is. A, uh, yeah. This is not uh, biocompatible. So you also need to take into account when you do industrial design, especially for wearables. Biocompatibility another, is another big consideration. So this module does not meet the biocompatibility requirements either. So it has to be uh, enclosed in an enclosure with a cover glass on top. Very good. Okay, uh, in one of the slides, you, you actually mentioned different body locations, but, uh, but can this module uh, be used for other, other body locations as well? Yes, uh, we have customers currently uh, using this on the wrist-based locations and uh, also evaluating for chest-based applications. Very good, okay. Um, so uh, I guess uh, this is a, a good question too. Uh, Maxim makes a lot of different modules. How does this module differ from uh, modules that Maxim has produced in the past? Great question again. So the standard, what we call a standard optical module, it is still a very specialized optical module. We call them standard optical modules. The Z height of these modules in the past that we've done was 1.4 millimeters. It included LEDs, photodiode, analog front ends, all the good stuff. The, but the Z height was about 1.4 millimeters. Uh, this one is a first of its kind, which where the Z height, we were able to bring it down under a millimeter. It is 0.88 millimeters. And uh, we have, uh, we're, we, we're continuously looking for opportunities to come up with new modules using the same technology. Okay, very good. Um, one of the points that you made in your presentation is that this module already has uh, the algorithm built in and it, it delivers a, 
an indication that's ready to use. Uh, is that uh, algorithm updatable, modifiable, user modifiable? Is there is there any way to change the firmware in the module? Uh, the firm, it's, it's a closed system. Uh, the, the firmware and the algorithms are locked in, but there is an option where you can upgrade the algorithm because Maxim is continuously improving the algorithm performance. So as and when the new algorithm releases are available, customers should be able to uh, update the algorithms. Having said that, there is some level of customization. There is an API, uh, a very uh, uh, flexible API. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. And not all customers want an algorithm output. Some customers also would like to see the raw data from both uh, the accelerometer as well as the PPG sensor. So we do have different uh, modes that you can run in. I could run it in a raw data mode, or I can run it in an algorithm mode, or I can run it in a combo mode, or I could run only heart rate or SpO2 or a combination of both. So there is an API where we built enough flexibility uh, that we think should cover 95% of the use cases. Uh, but if there is uh, any special requirement that we've not thought of or that is not covered by the existing firmware, we'll be more than happy to sit down and uh, discuss more in detail. Very good. Um, a, a question I'm sure is probably on a lot of folks' minds. Um, broadly speaking, what's a typical price uh, of this module uh, in, say, 10K uh, units? A great question again. Uh, my recommendation there is, unfortunately, I am not the pricing guy. Uh, my recommendation is would be to reach out to your local distributor or Maxim uh, representative, and they'll be more than happy to uh, provide a quote uh, for your volumes that you're looking for. Uh, that's what I always tell everybody. They don't let me play with the money. I just get to yeah. <laughs> talk about the technology. Yeah, um, that's right. Uh, a question has come in, and, and since these are all uh, going to be wearable, battery-operated things, what mm -hmm. is the uh, power consumption uh, of, of this device, and uh, and what's your recommendation in terms of uh, sizing a battery for it? Great question again. Um, when we talk about power for this module, there are several different things that come into play. Uh, it's not a straightforward equation saying, okay, this is the power of the AFE, this is the power of the MCU, this is the power of the LEDs. So you add it all up, would would give you the power, a single power number. When you talk about optical subsystems, the power really depends on uh, three factors. The skin tone, uh, light skin versus dark skin. Obviously, if uh, lighter skin, uh, you can get a better signal with lower LED current. If it's a darker skin, uh, they absorb more. the darker skin absorbs more light, which means you need to drive more LED current. Uh, the second uh, thing that depends on is the perfusion index. How well is a person perfusing? Same exact skin tone. Let's say uh, skin tone is measured on a Fitzpatrick scale of one to six, six being the darkest and one being the lightest. Uh, so even if you were to have a Fitzpatrick scale of four, let's say, for example, I'm a Fitzpatrick scale of four. So even at a Fitzpatrick scale of four, two individuals might be perfusing differently because somebody is more fit uh, compared to the others. A more fit person would have a much better blood flow or a blood perfusion as opposed to somebody uh, that is not as fit. So that's the second thing that depends on how well is the person perfusing. And the third factor it also depends on is the uh, environment you're in. If you're in a cold environment versus a warm environment, because that has a direct impact on your perfusion index. Uh, think of it this way. When you're in a cold environment, your body is trying to protect the heat. So it kind of constricts the blood flow. When you're in a warm environment, it, start, it wants to perspire more, so there is better circulation and better perfusion. And there is another factor, a fourth factor in, in this whole thing, is the activity the subject is doing. Is a subject sleeping, resting, running, biking, or just in the office doing office work? So all of these factors come into play uh, on, on the human subject side. On the optical design side, the spacing between the LEDs and the photodiodes play a big role in power consumption. So it's a very complicated uh, equation with a lot of dependencies. And we've come up with a power tool uh, that actually takes all of these into account for a specific optical design. And we can provide uh, what we call as a range of power budget, not a single number, but what could be your power budget range for a low perfusion, dark skin person versus a high perfusion, light skin person. That should give you a better idea in scaling up your battery size. 
Good answer. Um, next question has to do with uh, um, with any certifications or uh, 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 any kind of approvals that we already have. You mentioned that that our our target here is to be a clinical grade sensor. Uh, do we have any sort of uh, regulatory approvals uh, that are available or pending for this part? Uh, great question. I'm glad uh, uh, this gives me a chance to clarify. I want to make sure uh, I, I explicitly state this. We do not have any uh, medical certifications on our reference devices. We have tested it to to see if, if a device, if our customers would be able to pass uh, the FDA guidelines. We went to an independent lab. We tested how a device manufacturer would test it but we did not submit the device to FDA certification because FDA certification for, for example, on oxygen saturation is device dependent. And we're not, we're not selling product to consumers. It didn't make sense for us to get an FDA certification or a CE certification on our devices. We provide a reference device that has gone as far as testing it to meet clinical requirements to show customers that if they were to use this sensor and implement the design that we've come up with or a variation of that, they can be confident that they can get FDA approval. And we have customers who we have helped design their wearable device and successfully get FDA approvals as well. Very good. Now, I've got another question about power. Are, are power consumption uh, figures currently available uh, for, I guess, for the various operating modes of the, of the device? And uh, how does one get access to the, uh, uh, to the power numbers? Uh, great question. Please do send us an email uh, to the uh, email ID that you see on the screen, and we'll make sure we get back to you with uh, the power numbers for our reference design as a first step. But if you have a different optical design in mind, please do let us know and we can recalculate those numbers. We do not have a power tool that we can give to customers today. Uh, we are working on it. Uh, we are probably a few months away from getting there. But for now, we should be able to calculate the power numbers and send uh, an Excel output of our power tool to our customers. Very good. Um... Here's a more general question. Uh, someone is asking, uh, where do you see the wearables market going over the next three to five years? Oh, great question. Um, I expect wearables to come up with new form factors um, and uh, provide more actionable insights. I think that was a theme of my presentation that I wanted to drill as well. Uh, I think today's devices are able to monitor heart rate, heart rate variability. For example, I'll give you a very good example, right? Sleep apnea, let's talk about sleep as a use case. Sleep apnea is a very good use case, and a lot of people suffer with sleep apnea, and they don't even know they have sleep apnea. Today's wearable devices monitor heart rate and oxygen saturation, and I can see what my heart rate is and what my oxygen saturation is, and to some degree, our, uh, customer, uh, wearable devices are also able to provide what we call a sleep score. But it, beyond that, it doesn't really give me any actionable insights. Yeah, I didn't sleep very well last night. I mean, I can tell that in the, when I wake up in the morning. I'm glad my wearable device is keeping a track of that. But I don't get any actionable insights in terms of why I didn't have a poor, uh, didn't have a good sleep. Is it because I have, I am on the edge of a sleep apnea? Or is it because... I had uh, a restless night or because the ambient temperature in the room was not ideal enough for my body to rest. So there is a lot more contextual information and meaningful information that needs to be combined and integrated into wearables to provide that actionable insights. I think that is where the market is going. That is where wearable companies are going. And I truly believe uh, in the next three to five years, we will be able to realize uh, this, what we call as healthcare revolution it is going to be more market-driven uh, model than an insurance or a healthcare-driven model. Very good. And I think that is a dynamite place to wrap this thing up. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and for submitting some great questions for Sudhir. 
Also, thanks to Sudhir Mopuru for a really engaging presentation. Now, I'll remind everyone that after we sign off, you're going to see a request a meeting invitation that will pop up on your screen. You can use this if you'd like to schedule a visit with our team. And once again, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you at the next Maxim Integrated webinar.